back to PK here. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through a little bit of chapter one from J.D. Salinger's Catch in the Rye, just to kind of help you get a visual of what's happening in the particular text. You should be able to see on the right-hand side, just some images to kind of help you develop a camera in your head, right? Strong readers develop cameras as, as they're going along and reading. Um, I will also annotate verbally kind of like my thought process as I'm reading a, a more dense text like this. And so let's just review chapter one. So chapter one, Catch in the Rye. If you really want to hear about it, the first thing you'll probably want to know is where I was born, what my lousy child was like, and how my parents were occupied and all that before they had me, and all that David Copperfield kind of crap. But I don't feel like going into it, if you want to know the truth. All right, so we start to get a really strong sense of the personality of the main character. One of the big things with this book is it's going to go into this idea of voice, right? The main character, we, have, we don't know his name yet, but he's seemingly talking to us. He's talking to someone. Right? So that's why we have this image on the right-hand side here. Um, he's talking to someone and he's kind of like saying, hey, do you really want to know about all this? I'm not going to go into everything. All right? So we get this strong personality comes out and he even uses the word crap. Right? So in the first place, that stuff bores me. In the second place, my parents have about two hemorrhages apiece if I told anything pretty personal about them. So you get this sense that he's like, um, yeah, I'm not really going to tell you everything because my parents would freak out. Right? So again, that type of language um, kind of connotes a certain personality. We get to hear his voice. And so that's what this book is known for, is the voice and personality, right? So that stuff bores me. In the second place, my parents would have two hemorrhages apiece if I told anything about them, um, especially my father, right? Um, so as he's telling us this story, he's like, I'm not going to tell you, but then guess what he ends up doing? For the, If you look at the rest of this book, um, you will see that he tells us, he spends a long time telling us about this stuff. He says that he's going to focus on the stuff that happened to him just before Christmas, before he got pretty run down and had to come out here and take it easy. So it makes, should make you ask a question. So if you're doing higher level thinking, you should be asking questions like pretty run down. Like, what do you mean by run down? Right. Um, he says, that's all I told my brother DB about. And he's my brother and all. He's in Hollywood. Um, he comes over. So we also start to get a sense of the setting, too. So if you start to look. He talks about his brother having this Jaguar cost damn near 4,000 bucks. So it makes us think, okay, this is kind of like, okay, if a Jaguar costs damn near 4,000 bucks and his, and his brother's this fancy Hollywood guy, perhaps that um, the time setting, right? Um, we're going to have to start thinking, when would this take place where a Jaguar would only cost 4,000? A brand new Jaguar would probably be $4,000. We're thinking, okay, maybe, maybe like as we were thinking in class, maybe the 50s isn't a bad guess. All right, so then he goes on and he starts talking a little bit more about this thing called Pensy Prep. That's his school. And it says it's a school in Angersound, Pennsylvania. Again, notice the way he's talking to us. He says, you've probably heard of it. You've probably seen the ads anyway. They advertise about a thousand magazines, always showing some hotshot guy on a horse jumping over a fence. And so the narrator makes this assumption. So again, we get first person narration. He makes this assumption that we know what he knows. Right, so there's this this notion that um, that this place is famous enough that other people would be well aware of it, um, and that we are understanding what he's understanding. And so, Pensy must be this very fancy place because you look at notice it's called Pensy Prep. So it's likely a preparatory academy where you have kids maybe in uniforms, um, and and likely kids all having to kind of stay together in kind of this fancier place that's preparing them for perhaps college, right? So we don't know that yet, but I'm thinking that in my head as a strong reader. Um, and then I get more evidence of this place, so this setting. Um, since 1888, we've been molding boys into splendid, clear thinking young men. So we get a sense that, okay, so it's a place where they mold boys. So it's a boys academy, it's a boys prep academy. And so it starts making me think, okay, Angersound, Pennsylvania, East Coast. Okay, maybe it's one of those very fancy, expensive private schools where they help prepare kids for like Ivy League schools. And we'll see, if, well, that's kind of what I'm suspecting and thinking in my head as I'm reading along. Um, but notice what he says, strictly for the birds. So this is kind of a saying like, where he's suggesting that really, it's not really something that um, that's true. They, you know, they don't do any damn weird molding at Penn State, they do any other school. And I didn't know anybody there that was splendor or clear thinking at all. Maybe two guys, if that many. And they probably came to Penn State that way. I get the sense that he's not liking his school, right? He's saying that they advertise the school as this very fancy place where people do polo and um, it's, it's a great place to get an education. And he feels like, mm, yeah, actually, 
the people that came here were already educated or they, the school didn't make them better. And if they came here, if they are good, they came here that way already. It wasn't because of the school. So we get a sense that he doesn't like his school. Anyway, um, he talks about how where everybody's at. Um, he's standing on top of this hill um, where there's this revolutionary war cannon. So I think this is the school that I get envisioned in my head when I'm reading. Um, and he's at, at, he's on top of Thompson Hill, right, next to this revolution the cannon that used to be in the Revolutionary War and all. But everybody else was at the game. So this should make you tell think something about the character, the main character. Well, that wasn't good. This should make you think something about the main character, right? So if everybody is at Pensy is at the game and he's not at the game, what does that tell you about him? So just think about that. Okay. So there are never many girls at the football games. Um, yeah, but he would like to be at a place where you could see some girls every once in a while, even if they're just giggling or blowing their noses or something. Then he talks about the headmaster's daughter. So this is kind of like a principal, right? So the principal's daughter was there. She wasn't exactly the type that drove you mad with desire. Again, we're getting a lot of the strong personality in how he talks, right? How he would describe people. Um, he goes into this description of her. Um, talks about her, her, her dad being a phony slob. Again, we get the personality and the voice of the main character. Um, and then he says he was on top of Thompson Hill because he the fencing fencing team had to come back early right so they apparently he was involved on the fencing team and we noticed that he's not actually on the team but he's a he's a manager on the team so i was trying to look for a fencing picture um but he left all the foils and stuff on the goddamn subway it wasn't my fault right so we also get the sense that the narrator isn't the type of kid that accepts responsibility for things he does wrong so he left the foils and equipment um but he doesn't blame himself and so it's somebody else's fault, right? So he had to keep looking up via this map. Um, anyway, the whole team ostracized him. So what's ostracized mean? So you want to think about that. And here's a clue. He's a, um, he, how might treat people treat other people if they were mad at them? What are some strategies that people, sometimes people use? And if you look, it's going to lend into this theme that we have that's going to, that I'm going to call alienation versus acceptance. Um, and so what's going to happen is he is going to be on top of this hill all by himself. And on the way back from the, from the, from New York, um, the team ostracized him. So I think you should start to get a picture that maybe he's kind of a guy that gets pushed out a little bit. So this notion of alienation means that you're not accepted. That you don't have a sense of belonging with the group. Um, okay. So let's keep going. Um, he also says that the other reason that he was out of the game, because he was on his way to say goodbye to his teacher. Right. His teacher has some sort of illness um, and Christmas vacation started. Um, and then he says, look at this. I forgot to tell you about that. They kicked me out. I wasn't supposed to come back. So we already got a guess that he doesn't like his school. And guess what? He got kicked out of school for not applying himself or flunking out of su four subjects and all. So we get that. We, we start to get some ideas that this person is, is, has not been successful. Um, apparently he doesn't like school. So he's a, uh, essentially a dropout, right? And his parents are going to, um, they don't, they didn't know that he'd gotten the ax. They give the guy, they give the ax quite frequently. The guys at Pensy has a very good academic rating. It really does. So we start to learn that, okay, he dropped out. He maybe got kicked out. That's getting the ax means getting kicked out. Again, getting the ax is another saying, right? So we start to learn that his language is starting to kind of play in. Anyways, December and all, it was cold as a witch's teat. Again, his language. And he was on top of this stupid hill. Um, Okay, so as you're reviewing, you start to get a sense that he doesn't like this 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 place, um, and he really hasn't had a good experience there. Okay, sorry about that. I think I got interrupted by somebody. Um, and so, in any case, we get a sense that the main character really is a person that um, isn't really well connected with other people, right? That there's there there's an issue whereby he might not have a lot of people that really accept him, right? So that's the alienation theme. And so um, he starts talking about going to visit his teacher. And he says some things that are kind of are interesting. He says, I'm quite a heavy smoker for one thing, that is, they used to be. They made me cut it out. And another thing, I grew six and a half inches last year. That's how I also practically got TB and had to come out here for all these goddamn checkups and stuff. TB is like tuberculosis. It's like a lung condition. So obviously that combined with smoking wouldn't be pretty good. But then he says, I'm pretty healthy though. So he has to get all these checkups. He's in this place where he can't smoke anymore. And he got TB. 
But I'm pretty healthy though. So we get the sense that the main character, our narrator, also doesn't also, he's not really also necessarily honest either with himself or with us. And so then he starts going back and he says, um, he starts crossing a road and he says, it was icy as hell and I damn near fell down. I didn't even know what I was running for. I guess I just felt like it. After I got across the road, I felt like I was sort of disappearing. So this is interesting to me because the main, our main character says that he's disappearing as he's crossing the road. All right. Um, it's sort of that kind of crazy afternoon, terrifically cold and no sun or anything. And you felt like you were disappearing as you crossed the road. Again, he addresses the reader. So he's like, yeah, it's one of those days, you know, where you feel like you're disappearing, almost as if it was a common experience. So I need you to think to yourself, the last time you crossed the road, think, the last time you crossed the road, did you feel like you were disappearing? Or the time before that, did you feel like you were disappearing then? And so we get the sense that this narrator is talking as if everybody understands what he is going through, right? Which is disappearing as you cross the road. Um, and so another thing you should note is he damn near fell down. So I want you to pay attention to this because this is going to be a motif. You see it come up over and over again, but this is the first instance of that. He damn near fell down as he was crossing the road because it was icy as hell, right? Again, his language, icy as hell. Boy, I rang that doorbell fast when I got to old Spencer's house. It was really frozen. My ears were hurting. I could hardly move my fingers at all. Come on, come on, I said right out loud, almost. Somebody opened the door. Finally, old Mrs. Spencer opened it. So he's visiting his old teacher because he got kicked out of school. And he says, finally, oh, Miss Spencer opened it. They didn't have a maid or anything. They always opened the door themselves. Again, he talks about this as if it's like crazy to open the door yourself. And they didn't have the maid, right? Um, they didn't have too much dough. Hold in, Miss Spencer said. How lovely to see you. Come in, dear. Right? So he goes to visit his teacher. And that's how we end this chapter.